Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Curtis, and uh, we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. We're going to look at uh, the Lycus Valley churches, which is Laodicea, Colossae, and Hierapolis. We're going to look at them in a little bit different context today. We're going to veer off a little bit from just pure teaching and look a little bit more of the historical context of these three churches. But today I'm going to continue our tag team teaching through the letter to the Colossians, chapter 4. I want to spend this time together to look at the three churches, as I mentioned, of the Lycus Valley in what is today modern Turkey. Understanding the history, culture, and biblical context of these three cities will give you a better understanding of Paul's letter to the church of Colossae but also the churches at Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae that he mentions in Colossians chapter 4, verse 13. I will continue and f follow with a little bit more sober of a message when I conclude with Christ's rebuke to the church in Laodicea as seen in Revelation chapter 3. But first let's read Colossians chapter 4. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each, other, each one. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant of the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a fellow and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. <clears throat> Verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark the cousin of Barnabas and about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision, they have proved to be of comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, for I bear with him witness that he is a great, he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demos greet you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphos in the church that is in his house. Now when the epistle is read among you, <clears throat> see that you read it also in the church of Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. The salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. The three Lycus Valley River churches, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis, Hierapolis, now called Pamukkale, translates to the Cotton Castle, were located about 100 miles east of Ephesus. These three sister cities were in the old kingdom of, of Phrygia, which later became part of the Roman province of Asia. They are, they are in what is now modern-day southwestern Turkey. Hierapolis and Laodicea were only six miles apart 
facing each other across the Lycus River. They both were built on plateaus above the river. Colossae was 12 miles further upstream at the base of Mount Cadmus and was smaller than the other two towns. Colossae was built on the river, which may explain why we have such, have so few uh, historical artifacts left of that town. The area around these cities were very, was very wealthy. The Fertile Valley was used to raise sheep so that the cities of Laodicea and Colossae became famous for their dyed wool and clothes industry. Hierapolis was famous as a trade center, Roman resort, and thermal spa, which we'll see soon. Its famous hot springs were the destination of thousands of people who would travel and drink and bathe in their waters as it was believed to have medicinal properties. Sadly, Hierapolis also had a very large and well-preserved necropolis, a cemetery for those who never left alive. Within this large cemetery lies the tomb of the martyred Philip the Apostle. The Apostle Philip spent the last years of his life evangelizing in Hierapolis. The town shrine was alleged to have been built upon the spot where Philip was crucified in 80 AD. The church was probably founded by Epaphras while the Apostle Paul was in Ephesus. Antiochus the Great sent 2,000 Jewish families from Babylon and Mesopotamia into the area of Lydia and Phrygia. These Jews prospered more than the Gentiles who also lived in the area. Jews from Palestine moved into the region for the wines and the baths of Phrygia. It was estimated that in the year 62 BC, the Jewish population was as high as 50,000. The Jewish influence and local mythology had a negative impact on Paul's gospel in this Lycus Valley, as seen in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 through 22. Now we'll read from that. So let no one judge you in food or drink in re or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and the worship of angels, in, in, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by, the f by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows, within, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as through the living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. <clears throat> I want to pull up a map of the Lycus Valley and the Lycus Valley churches. You can see the relationship and it helps me when I'm tying in my mind the teachings of Paul to Colossae, the rebuke to the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3. When I look at those verses, it helps me when I look at the maps, the, the, the churches in context of the geographical locations, their history and their culture. As I mentioned earlier, Heropolis and Laodicea were built on plateaus above the river. Colossae was built at the head of the river, 12 miles upstream, and you could see, as they, as they, as they said on this map, that what affected one church would affect another. What affected the church of Laodicea, the people of Colossae would know. And the same with Hierapolis. Let's look at a few photographs of the ancient ruins of Hierapolis. Hierapolis would be a city to the 14th century, which is the reason these ruins are in such 
preserved state as they are. This is the remains of the Hierapolis Theater. The theater was rebuilt into the side of a hill after the A.D. 60 earthquake. The well-preserved theater was large enough to seat 15,000 people. And you can see it is very well preserved for its age. This is the necropolis. This is probably one of the best preserved cemeteries in all of Turkey for its age. You can see the tombs. It was very large because so many people would go to Hierapolis for the spas and the medicinal purposes of the hot springs. And a lot of them did not leave alive. So they have a very large cemetery. After the AD 60 earthquake that devastated the three valley cities and the, and the rerouting of the Sardis trade road from Colossae to Laodicea, the city of Colossae would decline and it would become a major market town by the end of the first century. The site of Colossae was discovered in 1835 but remains, unex and, but remains unexcavated to this day. And I attribute as a geologist a lot of that to the fact that they were built down by the river. And as that river experienced regional flooding, uh, sediment washed in amongst the ruins. The city of Hierapolis was granted to Rome in BC 133 and flourished, reaching its peak of importance in the second and third centuries AD. Having been destroyed by the 60 AD earthquake and rebuilt, it was finally abandoned in the 14th century, explaining the amazing, well-preserved archaeological site. Hierapolis, now Pamukkale, is world famous for its natural travertine limestone deposits and 17 hot springs. Crowds still travel there today to see what is called the Cotton Castle. And I will bring up a photograph, two photographs. This is the overlay. This is from um, uh, Google Maps. You can see and the circle on the top of the picture that are the remains of Hierapolis. The white are the travertine deposits that flow from 17 hot springs down into the valley beneath it. This is what they look like in person. Very beautiful. As a geologist, this is on my bucket list. This is beautiful. This is, the, 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 this is what existed in the day of Hierapolis and during Paul's letter to the Church of Colossae. This is called the Cotton Castle and its travertine terraces were created by Hierapolis' calcium-rich spring water Travertine is a type of limestone formed by mineral deposits, in this case, calcium, commonly found in the, around the hot springs. And you need to remember these hot springs ranged almost to boiling. They range from 212 Fahrenheit to 90 Celsius. They're very, very warm and hot. Here's another picture of how beautiful Hierapolis is today. This is what attracted so many Jews and Gentiles and Greeks to the area. They believed that these pools, that these springs had medicinal properties and it caused this valley to thrive with the population and with wealth. There are 17 hot springs in the area that make up the Hierapolis Travertine Terraces. Hieropolis sits now over an active fault line, as you probably have guessed with the earthquakes, that generates frequent earthquakes. Fractures in the earth create, created by the earthquakes allow thermal waters to reach the surface to create the hot springs. Across the terraces, there are a total of 17 springs which range in temperature from 35 to 100 degrees Celsius or 95 to 12, 212 Fahrenheit. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. These, and that's important because we're going to read in Revelation 3 that Christ alludes to this boiling hot water. 
These hot springs deposit calcium over the terraces as the water trickles over the cliffs below. Over time, the water dries and the calcium petrifies, leaving the cotton castle with what perfect white color. Thousands of years of this calcium deposits being layered upon on top of each other create that turquoise colored travertine pools that you see today. But as beautiful and white as the cotton castle was, spiritually dark was the city of Hierapolis. Can you find me, Jim? Go down. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Let me read from Wikipedia. The Phrygians built a temple dedicated to the mother goddess Sibylle on the site probably in the first half of the 7th century BC. This temple originally used as the indigenous communities living in the Lycus Valley would later form the center of Hierapolis. When the Greek colonists arrived and built the city on the pre-existing pattern of the settlement, the ancient cult of Sibylle was gradually assimilated into Greek religion. From well before the time of the Greek colonization, the area was seen as a gateway to the underworld and a place of communication with the underworld deities because of the toxic gases that emerged from hot springs inside the cave. According to Strabo and Damasius, the temple built on the top of the cave was linked to the mother goddess Sibylle. After the, pro after the process of assimilation into Greek culture, it was associated with Hades, Pluton, and, and uh, Persephone instead of Sibylle. And the temple was named Plutonium. Reading from Bible Archaeology Society's website, shrouded in misty poisonous vapors, Pluto's gate, or the Plutonium, was the cave entrance sacred to Pluto, the Roman god of the underworld. According to the first century ge geographer Strabo, the site would, was home to the rituals in which many animals entering this enclosed met with sudden death. Hierapolis archaeologist Francesco D'Andrea reconstructed the root of the area's thermal spring to discover Pluto's gate, which was destroyed by Christians in the 6th century. The Plutonium's infamous mystique is not just the stuff of legend. During the excavation of the cave, several birds were killed by carbon dioxide emissions as they approached Plutonium's cave's entrance. But despite Hierapolis' spiritual dark beginnings, during the 4th century, the Christian faith would dominate the region. Here is a picture of the remains as of today if you were to visit Hierapolis. In the foreground of this picture of the remains of Hierapolis is Apollo Temple. Its foundation dates to the Hellenistic period, but the structure itself was built in the third century AD. Apollo was thought to be the city's divine founder. The temple was built beside the Plutonium, an underground cavern from which poisonous gases emerged. The, theaters, the, the city's theater stands in the very background of this photograph. But if you were to actually take a tour bus and visit the on-site Hierapolis, this is what you'd see with the Travertine Springs. But I want to talk to you today about Laodicea a city that established its roots before the Roman Empire and 260 years before Christ. This is what it would look like today if you were to go see. One of the reasons it's so well preserved is because it sits on a plateau above the river basin. But this is what you'd see in Laodicea. Here's a second photograph of the remains of the temple of Laodicea. 
I find it fascinating as a geologist, uh, want to be archaeologist, that these cities remain even in the, in the form they do today at all. It's, it's a wonder that the excavation is, is uh, revealed. It was, a, but Laodicea is a city of 80,000, was a city of 80,000 people that was built on the Lycus River in 261 BC. This city was 12 miles west of ancient Colossae and the 99 miles east of Ephesus. As I mentioned earlier, it was only six miles away from Hierapolis. Originating as a common and insignificant city in 220 BC, it became a city of great wealth, and by 133 BC, it fell under Roman control, where it suffered greatly from the Mith Mithratic Wars between 88 BC and 63 BC. Benefiting from their position on the trade routes, their banking community, and the famed black wool trade, it became a flourishing and very wealthy commercial center in Asia Minor. It was in 60 AD, during the reign of Nero, that Laodicea would be destroyed by a devastating earthquake. But its wealth was so great that it rebuilt itself without imperial assistance. It was once again famed for its wealth, Greek arts, cultural science, and literature, as well as having founded a great medical school. The medical school was known specifically for compounding medicines and ointments for the sick. This was a fitting location for the medical school, being only six miles away from the thermal springs of Hierapolis and the people that those drew. They, speci they specifically became known for an eye salve, this is very important, for an eye salve made from local compounds. They minted their own coins and were declared a free city by Rome as the chief city of the Roman Conventus. Many of the inhabitants were Jewish whose ancestors had been transported from Babylonia. With its large Jewish population, <coughs> Laodicea would become an early seed of Christianity. During the reign of Roman Emperor Domitian, AD 81 through 96, emperor worship was declared. Mark Fairchild of Huntington University writes, as part of the Pax Romana, the, mon the monotheistic Jews in the cities of the Mediterranean world were exempt from the requirements of emperor worship as long as, long as Christianity was considered a sect of Judaism or within Judaism, the Christians in these cities were likewise exempt from emperor worship. At first, the Christian church was composed almost entirely of Jews. And that might be why you see the influence in the letter to Colossians that Paul writes. However, as more Gentiles converted to Christianity, the percentage of the Jewish people in the, in the Christian church decreased. And therefore, the special status held by Christians as Jewish monotheists, which permitted them to refrain from emperor worship, was removed. Those who refused to worship the image of the emperor were killed. The pressure upon rich Christians to maintain their wealth was intense. Since a great deal of Laodicea's wealth depended upon trade, the Christian merchants were in a quandary. They either would cooperate with the imperial cult and maintain their trade associations, or they would forswear a demission and re reaffirm their faith in Christ. Think about that plight for just a moment when we read Revelation 3. The Laodicean, Laodiceans are also mentioned by Paul in his letter to the Church of Colossians and his first letter to Timothy. Paul's epistles were also read within their church assemblies. Sadly, Paul's letter to the church in Laodicea was never found. I would surmise that it would address similar problems that were found in their sister church in Colossae. 
Recent archaeology attests to Laodicea's former greatness. To date, the Senate chambers, stadium, baths, temples, gymnasium, and theaters, and Ephesus Gate have been re renovated. The archaeological effort has also discovered the remains of their extensive aqueduct system that incorporated a siphoning system, double pressure pipeline, header and terminal distribution tanks, and extensive clay pipelines that distributed the water around town. The geothermal springs of Hierapolis were located about six miles north and flowed toward the city. Also flowing into the city from nearby Colossae were the cold springs. Now you have to remember, Hierapolis was known for their boiling hot water. Colossae was known for their cold water because it came down from the mountain. These sources were high in minerals, arrived warm, and caused significant problems with calcification in their aqueduct. You could probably picture their aqueduct look a lot like those uh, limestone deposits that we see on the uh, south side of Hierapolis. The water was a questionably hard, calcium and magnesium rich, warm and distasteful. But despite its distasteful water, the city was magnificent, independently wealthy, educated in the sciences and the arts, and a seat of Roman politics. The city also had an assembly of believers that was established indirectly by the imprisoned Apostle Paul and the pastoral care of Epaphras. It was a city that proclaimed, the, its, it proclaimed its greatness for 754 years before it was permanently destroyed by an earthquake in AD 494. But despite its wealth, its fame and power and culture, the city of Laodicea lives in history for one single reason. It's rebuke in Revelation chapter 3. To borrow a statement from the Apollo mission 13, Laodicea, we have a problem. Revelation 3, 14 through 32. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now I'm going to look at Romans, I mean, excuse me, Revelation, Revelation chapter 3, and I'm going to point out what we know historically they knew to show you how applicable this letter was to them, how dead center it hit them with what they knew starts out the beginning of the creation of God. You have to remember that the Laodiceans had read the letter to the Colossians and had it. Because by the time that this, by the time that Revelation 3 was written, about 95 or 96 AD, the letter to the Colossians had already existed for 35 years. So the Laodiceans knew exactly what was being told them since they had the letter to the Church of Colossae, 12 miles down the road. Reading from that letter, you got to remember, the angel said, the beginning of the creation of God. That takes us back to the letter they had, probably in their keeping at that time, in Colossians 1, 15 through 18. And this is what Paul wrote to the Colossians that they had in their keeping. He is the in image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that in heaven and, on, and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. So when, when Christ started this rebuke and said the beginning of the creation of God, they knew exactly through the letter of the Church of Colossae who was referring to. 
to continue in verse 15 of Revelation 3. I know your works, that you are neither cold, the springs of Colossae, nor hot, the geothermal springs of Hierapolis. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Laodiceans knew exactly what that meant. This is a reference to something that all three churches in the Lycus Valley understood. The water in Laodicea was warm, distasteful, and just downright bad tasting. As, it will, as I will discuss shortly, this is about living dual identities. In verse 17, because you say, I am rich, and they were. I have become wealthy, and they had, and had no need and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Let's look at what that meant to the church of Laodicea. Laodicea and the other Lycus Valley cities were very wealthy and well clothed with the finest dyed wool apparel. Both Laodicea and Colossa were famous for their dyed wool. It is no accident that the Spirit offers them garments of white. They are arrogantly self-identified as wealthy, spiritually indifferent, and in need of nothing that they could not supply for themselves. Second point, the Laodiceans also boasted of their medical school and their compounded eye salve. Yet with all they owned and accomplished, the Spirit tells them that they are poor, blind, and naked, and to anoint their own eyes with eye salve so that they may see. In 1 Timothy, I want to read in verse 6 through 6 through 10. Now godliness with contentment is a great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we carry nothing out. But having food and clothing, with these we, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For, it, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness, and perceive themselves, and, excuse me, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, the rebuke continues. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous. Again a reference to the boiling hot waters of Hierapolis. That word zealous properly means to bubble over because it's so hot that it's boiling. Therefore be zealous, be hot, be boiling, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want to take this rebuke in a couple directions. First, I want to point out that the Father always speaks to each spiritual son in a language they understand. The people in Laodicea understood exactly what the Spirit was saying to them. All the way from their water to their eye salve, they knew exactly what was being said. Everything that we discussed and highlighted in that rebuke has been discussed today. Everything Christ spoke and John wrote was clearly understood 
by the believers of Laodicea. This rebuke hit them dead center. The city of Laodicea was positioned on the trade routes between Colossae and Ephesus. And its church in Laodicea was built on the foundation of Christ and the apostolic ministry of Paul. Having received an apostolic epistle themselves and reading those written to the surrounding churches of Colossae and Ephesus. By the time John would write what is today the book of Revelation, approximately A.D. 95 through 96, the city of Colossae would be in decline, and the center of the Lycus Valley would become Laodicea. That's why I believe this letter was written to Laodicea. I'm, persu I'm persuaded that Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans, one that obviously did not survive for inclusion in the canon of the scripture. Which happened, to, which happened to it? What happened to it? I don't know. We don't know. But it's possible that it was destroyed in the massive earthquake that hit the region in 60 AD. But that is only my speculation. Secondly, the Laodicean believers were neither cold nor hot, but rather lukewarm, just like their distasteful water. There was nothing in their spiritual life that separated them from the world. They had become comfortable and smug, and their identity was inseparable from the world around them. The believers in the church of Laodicea were spiritually birthed, but they were outwardly conformed to the world. They were not transformed by the renewing of their minds, as Paul speaks to Romans, to their true spiritual identity. Simply, they lived in the identities of their flesh, very possibly very possibly from their perceived need to survive Roman Emperor Domitian's decree of emperor worship. It's easy to look down on judge the church of Laodicea, but when I read the rebuke to the church of Laodicea, my thoughts go directly to the church today. Believers have conformed to the identities of this world and have become dull of hearing no longer caring and indifferent to spiritual understanding. Like the Laodiceans, they say, I am rich, I become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. But do not know that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked in the identities of their flesh. God the Father has been reduced to an emergency phone call when a crisis arises. And unlike the Laodiceans, we are not yet persecuted to the point of death. I want to read Hebrews 12, 4 through 6. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. <clears throat> And do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves, and he chastens every, every one he accepts as his son. We attend, we attend churches that tickle our ears and denominations that align with our political, our sexual, cultural, and religious identities. Furthermore, the church has been defiled by its political alliances and has challenged exchanged the truth of truth excuse me get some water thank you as I was saying furthermore the church has been defiled by its political alliances and it has exchanged the truth of spiritual new birth for religion and politics this is not the gospel of which we are the ambassadors. This does not reveal the mystery of spiritual sonship through spiritual birth. The rebuke to the church of Laodicea could be written to the church today. The church preaches an impotent gospel, a gospel that reveals neither the spiritual sonship nor the identity of God the Father. The born again have settled for religion at the expense of the realization of who they were spiritually born again to be. To him who overcomes, Christ will grant him to sit with him on the throne, 
as he has also overcome and sat down with his Father on his throne. For we were created for a purpose higher than what we can understand or ever realize. We speak, this Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age, for had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor hath entered the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. You know, I was thinking a couple weeks ago about how magnificent this calling, how magnific magnificent this election, this predestination to be the spiritual sons of God way that God is and how beyond the everyday everyday co commotion that we see and we hear how incredible it is that we are called to become the sons of God it it, it puts things in context it puts life in context it puts death in context And again, let me read that last scripture. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Reading again from Bible Ar Archaeological Survey uh, Society. It reads, Yet the Laodicean church's lukewarm legacy was not its final legacy. The church at Laodicea would survive Domitian's reign. The city became a, see, a seat of, of a Christian bishop and a Christian council was even held there in the 4th century A.D. Archaeologists have discovered in Laodicea about 20 ancient Christian chapels and churches at the site. The largest church of Laodicea, called the Church of Laodicea, took an entire city block and dates to the beginning of the 4th century. I would say that the rebuke was heeded. Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea, these are the three churches in the Lycus Valley, and now you know the rest of the story. Live as a spiritual son of God, because that is who you are. Amen. Yes, the email up. Uh, I can be contacted at this email address if you have any questions. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you very much.